This is Seeking Delphi, episode number 20, Ending Aging, part two, with Elizabeth Parrish. I'm Mark Sackler, the future lives here. We ended 2017 with part one of Ending Aging with the author of Ending Aging, Aubrey de Grey. In that podcast, several other names were mentioned in reference to research into reversing human aging. Most notably among those is Elizabeth Parrish, CEO of BioViva, who became the first person ever to publicly acknowledge having had genetic editing therapy administered to herself to reverse some aspects of biological aging. I was most fortunate to reach her recently in her office in the Pacific Northwest. We begin the second year of this program now with that interview. Liz, welcome to Seeking Delphi, and thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Mark. It's great to be here. Liz, you made biotech and bioethics headlines uh, a couple of years ago when it was revealed that you had traveled to Columbia, the country, not the uh, not the university, and had some genetic editing performed on yourself. Uh, for those of our listeners that may not be familiar with the story, just update us uh, again, review what it was that you had done before we go on to the present state of affairs. So uh, in 2015, uh, after launching uh, my company, BioViva, I took two gene therapies, uh, the first dual gene therapy to treat uh, biological aging. One of them was a therapy that lengthens the telomeres at the ends of your chromosomes. So all of our cells have a division limit, and they're limited by the, the length of the telomeres. Essentially, your telomeres shorten as your cells divide. And we can actually predict the age span of organisms based on how fast their telomeres go through attrition. So some organisms have long telomeres, some of them die with long telomeres, some of them have short telomeres and live a very long time, but it's how fast those telomeres shorten. So with humans, it's about 50 to 60 cell divisions, and it's limited by the length of your telomeres. So this gene therapy lengthens the telomeres, therefore giving you more cell divisions and hopefully a longer life. The second gene therapy in the that was part of the therapeutic was a myostatin inhibitor. It increases your muscle mass. And so myostatin itself is a protein that limits muscle growth throughout your lifespan. And as we get older, it limits it more and more to this point that um, we actually have muscle attrition. So muscle wasting over time is what we see in older folks. We see frailty. It leads to broken hips, the inability to live in a house with stairs, and uh, much sooner than that, the inability to be a productive worker. So this gene therapy uh, increases the muscle mass in the body and uh, essentially creates a more robust human. So we did a, a combinatorial therapy uh, where I took both of the therapeutics uh, because we believe they have a synergistic effect. And we continue to work towards more therapeutics and more combinatorial therapeutics that we'll like to bring to the public for consensual use and for proper trials. So it's been a little over two years since you've had the work done, Liz. And uh, on your website, I don't see an update any more recent than uh, March of last year. So what's the prognosis at this point? How are you faring? Any change in status? Still feeling good? Still steady state, or, or is there something new to report? We're steady on course. We don't see things changing. We say, see things stay, sticking towards the positive side. We have since then, maybe potentially since then, done some cancer testing to ensure that I don't have cancer in my body. I'm at a very low risk of cancer, which is fantastic. You know, with gene therapy, the beauty of it is, is what we're looking to create is just the protein in the cell that makes you healthier. 
So we don't expect to see side effects like we do with pharmaceutical drugs where you ingest a, a pill and it might have some uh, off-targeted effects of damaging your kidneys or your liver or, or something like that. Where And then we look for very few. It's all side effects that pharmaceutical drugs give you. Some of them are positive and many of them may be negative. Gene therapy is very different. It's considered a very precise medicine where we're just making the proteins that we're looking for. So if there was a protein that had negative side effects, we just wouldn't use it. I understand you had to go to Columbia to get this done, obviously to circumvent a regulatory limitations here in the US. So when will something like this be available for trial or some of us, whatever, here, here, here in the US? So far, you've only got N equals one for data. You're obviously gonna need to try this in a lot more people. BioViva is looking at different locations around the world to do expedited trials. We're also going to be working hand in hand with a company that's offering consensual use of gene therapy where in the world we can actually give that. So if you want to wait for drugs like this to be passed through the U.S. FDA, you're going to have to wait 15 to 20 years and a company is going to have to raise a billion or a billion and a half dollars. We think that's the wrong way to move forward with medicine. Over 150,000 people die every day, and we would like to give expedited use of the therapeutics, collect the human data that will then allow countries like the United States to start using these drugs right in the country for a fraction of the price and a fraction of the time. Well, I kind of have to thank you. You sort of made me look smart. I made a prediction early in 2016 before you made it public that this had been done, that people are going to start going offshore to do this or find other means to get around the, the slow regulatory process. Yeah, I've been <laughs> arguing for a, a couple of years with people who didn't believe that people would start doing this in their homes within the next few years. And now we see that there are kits uh, available uh, online yeah. Yeah, that you can start using the technology at home. So BioViva is probably considered a more conservative approach because we're asking that people use medical doctors and that you let us do prognostics and diagnostics before and after so that we actually know what's working and we don't work in the vagaries of uh, do-it-yourself home therapeutics. I'm going to use myself as an example here now. I'm 67 in fairly good health. My father and two of his male first cousins lived into their 90s. So what do you think the chances are that I might benefit from some of this therapy within my lifetime, even if I have to travel offshore to get it? Well, I think that actually, as long as we're not risk adverse and we don't, you know, demand that that these type of technologies are slowed down, I think that you will very likely see some sort of use of therapeutics in your lifetime that you'll be able to afford and that will prolong your life long enough to help us get to a combinatorial cure uh, that will actually be the definitive treatment that will actually stop or reverse biological aging. So you dealt with just two aspects of aging with these initial procedures. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, for example, cites a total of seven key areas of damage in the aging process. So I'm wondering, uh, what additional ones are you going to address? And does your total count agree with Aubrey? Yeah, sure. So we believe that there's 10 hallmarks of age aging. So we believe in a few more than Aubrey might. We believe that some of the therapeutics will target more than one of those areas, like the actual telomere lengthening actually targets about four of the areas, one of them being mitochondrial dysfunction, the other ones being intra and extracellular communication, and then telomere attrition being the fourth one. So we think that if we can find therapeutics that tackle all 10 of these, we could potentially bring the aging process potentially to a halt in the human body, but then we have to work on regeneration. And so that will be even more therapeutic. So the areas that we're missing right now is glycation and proteostasis issues, which are uh, similar to, they're about the same thing. So they're, they're different areas of, of protein buildups and or accumulation with uh, sugars in the cells that we have a hard time breaking down. But we continue to look for uh, therapeutics that will cover all 10 hallmarks, and that's why we don't think that it will be one or two treatments to actually reverse biological aging. 
I'm going to bring up another name now that I know you're familiar with because he's on your board of directors. That would be Dr. George Church of Harvard University. Now, he's got his own scheme and own program. He's going to start testing an age reversal therapy in dogs next year and hopefully follow that up in humans in 2022. Are you familiar with he's, with what he's doing? Is it in any way related to or similar to what you're doing? Well, what they're doing is 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 quite amazing, and they're looking at you know the editing of several genes at one time, and that will be uh, what the future of the technology looks like to remit uh, the, the biological aging. Uh, and of course, uh, we're excited about that technology. We're excited about any of their advances that they have. I assume that outside of those technologies, we'll need things like the use of stem cells to rehabilitate and, and regrow uh, some of the areas. And we'll also need uh, neuron stimulators so that we can regrow the neurons in the brain. There's, there's probably a few things that might not be capitulated in there, but I'm very, very excited about all of the work that George is doing. I mean, you have to realize that George has access to the most research, the most funding for research in the world. And so our eyes definitely turn to him when it comes to what the advances will actually be. As far as getting early human data, that's BioViva's job. So we can do many things in dogs and mice, but we actually need human data of what happens when something happens in a human. So for instance, one human data is worth a billion mice because there are many drugs that have never translated out of uh, mice models, mouse models to humans. And there are uh, some drugs that might have killed mice that were passed, you know, long before we had those animal models to humans that, that, were, that were very important in moving therapeutics forward for humans. So we're very excited about what George is doing. And, and of course, all research and development we look at as a potential for the future of humans. The, the problem right now is targeting a whole human adult body with these technologies, and that's, that's part of, of the work that's being done, and that's why the human work uh, can't be diminished by work that's being done anywhere else. So would you say that the stuff you're doing then is more to retard or stop aging than to reverse it? I would say until we have uh, evidence uh, that we can... the, the, the Telomere lengthening gene therapy did reverse aging in human cells and in animal models, but doing it in a whole organism. And so that's what I'm saying is the issue. So even if you have the perfect therapeutic, actually getting it to work in a, in a, a human organism is a bit of the challenge. Moving toward a conclusion here, Liz, I want to ask you a couple of things that I also asked Aubrey de Grey. And the first of those would be, What's your take on David Wood's forecast in his book, Abolition of Aging, The Abolition of Aging, which I believe you were mentioned in? And that is, he says there is a 50% chance of widely available, affordable human rejuvenation therapy by the year 2040. How do you feel about that? Well, again, I think that it, it depends on how risk adverse we are. Uh, BioViva with a consulting company will start working this year to start getting human data in 2018 as to how well the therapies that we have right now work. They may work well enough to be considered one of those type of therapeutics, but we have to prove that in yeah. over 10 patients. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very optimistic that by 2040, either the human race will be going extinct or we will have modified ourselves significantly with these new therapeutics. So, and, it, and by the way, that's basically what uh, David did, said, a 30% chance of of collapse <laughs> in, in that other 50%, and I, I vary on that. So our job is to enhance human bodies first against biological aging, and then to enhance them to keep up with the rate of progress, hopefully, in robotics, so that human bodies are as competitive, uh, both cognitively and physically, as anything else that we can create, is as close we can get with a biologic. So we're very excited about the future, uh, but we're still starting with very simple premises because laws and regulations 
have held us back from actually helping people. We allow people to die rather than to access new therapeutics, even if they're dying. So we believe that the terminally ill especially should have access to anything uh, that they would like and help pioneer the future for the rest of the world. But apparently this is a difficult uh, conversation and something called bioethics is probably the least ethical thing on the planet right now is allowing hundreds of thousands, millions of people a year to die, over 40 million people a year to die without access to new technologies. And it's completely incomprehensible at this point. Okay, and the second question that I uh, am giving you that I gave Aubrey is what about metformin and rapamycin and the like, uh, drugs that are going into trials, the former to human trials, the latter into canine trials to try to slow down the aging process, help uh, us live healthy a little longer, but not really to stop or reverse the aging process. And uh, I, won't, um, I won't tell you what Aubrey had to say. I don't, I don't know that I'm familiar with his views on it, but I think that we, we move, move forward very slowly for how fast technology is advancing. And, um, and I believe that the, the trials in metformin and rapamycin are long overdue, and it's fantastic that people are doing them. Uh, they are not powerful enough uh, to create uh, the, the, the homeostatic life form uh, that we really need in order to beat the diseases that we die of today, which I have to remind you is a natural process. So antibiotics and immunization and sanitation and seat belts and eyeglasses and everything else are, are human enhancements that we've all embraced. And, and I believe that the community will embrace these technologies as, as soon as they're proven. So even though I don't think that those drugs are the cure, they are actually a proving ground. So it's very exciting for science to prove that something might slow the biological aging process or uh, remove some senescent cells from the body, creating a healthier organism. I think we better crack on with those quite quickly, but not uh, leave behind these, these greater, more powerful technologies. And we need to crack on with all of them at the same time. So uh, and learn when to use them. So gene therapies now will probably be given in, in relatively older patients uh, who are more terminally ill, who are, have amassed a, a greater deal of damage. But the, whole, the most benefit would be to use them in younger people. So maybe some of these drugs could be intermittently used in younger people whilst we start to move the gene therapies back uh, as immunizations against biological aging and as preventative medicine. So I, I'm not negative about anything. I think that any progress is is good progress, but there is such thing as too slow progress. By the way, he was for them for some of the reasons anything to move forward. And uh, from my standpoint, having been in the pharma industry, just the fact that the FDA approved the metformin trials is probably a step forward. But he also said that because they're based to kind of like on the metabolism of calorie restriction, that they they weren't going to have much effect other than maybe to live a little healthier <laughs> longer, but, yeah. but not necessarily live longer. So this is great. I want to thank you for your time. Personally, I've got this theory that whatever was done to your muscles might have been done to, to David Ortiz and Tom Brady at age 40, because I can't believe what either of them have done it at, as athletes at age 40. But at any rate, um, th and, this and is remember, uh, something like a myostatin inhibitor will be a lot more powerful against metabolic disorder than metformin. So if we do a gene therapy and we increase the muscle mass, uh, we already see increased insulin sensitivity. We see redu reduction in, in fat. And so basically, it's a direct way to affect the metabolic disorder that leads to type 2 diabetes. So, I mean, what do you want to do? You want to pop a pill that has some moderate effect, or do you want to take a gene therapy once in your life or maybe twice in your life that you won't have to remember to take that pill? Liz, thanks for joining us. And of course, best of luck and improving results with all your efforts going forward. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was wonderful to be here and to spread more of the word of how exciting the future is. And even for people who are a little bit hesitant of where technology is going, uh, they have a, a beautiful, bright future that will reduce many of the limitations that they may have naturally had in their life and and create a, a whole new image of, of their future as well. As research continues to advance toward the biotech mainstream and public awareness grows, 
the controversy surrounding the subject of reversing human aging is bound to grow with it. Of particular note in this context is Liz Parrish's intimation that bioethics has become unethical in impeding personal choice and the overall pace of progress. Never mind artificial intelligence, significant and broadly available age reversal therapy could potentially become the single most disruptive technology in human history. Expect to hear more about this from one or more experts in the bioethics field in a future episode of Seeking Delphi. Also, be sure to keep up with this and many other stories relevant to our future in News of the Future weekly blog posts at www.seekingdelphi.com. And don't forget that you can subscribe to these programs on Player FM, iTunes, and YouTube, and follow us on Facebook. Just search for Seeking Delphi. On Twitter, search for Mark Sackler. That's me, and until next time, thank you for listening.